All right. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I am Ravi Kalam, the MLA for Delta North and the Parliamentary Secretary for Forest Lands, Natural Resource Operations and Rural Development. Uh, welcome to our virtual town hall on education in BC as we come together to discuss how we're safely bringing more students back into the classrooms this June. Uh, I'm here on the territory of the Coast Salish people, which includes the Tawasan First Nations. Uh, before we uh, get to the main event, uh, my son really wanted me to thank his teacher, uh, Miss Kondo. So if you're watching, thank you uh, for all the support over the last few weeks. And in particular, uh, he wanted me to tell you that he's really looking forward to uh, seeing you very soon. So, uh, so now on to the main events. Uh, today, I have two uh, special guests joining me from the traditional territories of the Kwangan speaking people, the Songhees and Esquimalt, uh, Minister of Education, Rob Fleming, and Dr. Trevor Corneal, medical lead in the office of the provincial health officer. Uh, and we're also joined from the territory of the Sunemu First Nations, uh, Stephanie Higginson, president of the BC School Trustees Association. We're also joined by ASL uh, translator, Nigel Howard. So welcome everyone. I'll, I'll be the teacher. I'll say, welcome, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, <laughs> Ravi. <laughs> Hi. How are you? But, so the COVID-19 pandemic affects us all as British Columbians and has uniquely impacted students and their families. There's approximately 625,000 students in BC attending uh, over 1,900 schools, big and small. And we know that families have struggled over the past two months as most children were learning from home. As we start to look safely to bring more students back to class, there are already 5,000 students, children of essential service workers and students who require extra support attending schools full time today. And they will soon be joined by more of their peers. We know uh, there are a lot of questions about how students are going to have the option to return to schools starting June 1st uh, in a gradual and a, in a safe way. We also have about 61,000 graduating students who after 13 years of studying together will need the time in school to finish their coursework and prepare for the immediate future. For all students, there is no substitute for in-class learning and seeing their friends again. Minister Fleming, Stephanie Higginson, and Dr. Corneal are here to answer your questions and to help give us all a better idea about how schools are going to look for students next week. First, Minister Fleming will start us off with some brief remarks, followed by remarks from Stephanie and Dr. Corneal. We will then get to your questions. For those of you who have a question to ask and were unable to submit the question ahead of time, you may submit your questions in the comment section of the live event here on Facebook. Over the last few days, we've received hundreds of questions. We have organized them in themes so that everyone's questions is covered as much as possible. For those questions coming in live today, we're going to try to get through as many as we can. So uh, let's just jump right in. Uh, Minister Fleming, why don't you start us off? Thank you so much, Ravi. And uh, thank you for that territorial acknowledgement of the Lekongan speak people's uh, territory where I'm speaking to uh, everyone uh, who has joined us uh, tonight. I wanna thank everyone who's taken the time out from their busy lives, their busy evenings to, uh, to join us. Uh, very appreciative to have Stephanie Higginson here, the president of the BC School Trustees Association and uh, Dr. Trevor Corneal from the PHO. Um, I wanna first just begin by thanking uh, so many British Columbians for working in collaboration to get our province to the place uh, where we're at today, where we have a restart plan for the province. Uh, that has begun uh, uh, most recently and uh, in, a, in, a, in the month of June, uh, we're here to talk about what a school restart will look like slowly and cautiously, just like every step of BC's management of this pandemic has been. Uh, we wouldn't be here without the collaboration we've had in British Columbia with parent groups, with teachers, healthcare professionals have been vital. And, uh, and the incredible effort that the province of British Columbia, all British Columbians have made to flatten the curve and keep our communities safe. And uh, in, that, uh, in that vein, I want to pass along my gratitude uh, to our frontline healthcare workers, all of our first responders, other essential workers who've made tremendous sacrifices to keep British Columbians safe. And a huge thank you goes out to all the people in our school communities, teachers, support staff, uh, First Nations educators, principals and vice principals, students especially, parents, superintendents, trustees, all of our education partners. All of them have done an amazing job helping each other get through this extraordinary time. 
And we will look back at this time for the rest of our lives. There is no doubt about that. Remembering how we as British Columbians stepped up, rallied together, worked together to flatten the curve and keep our, keep our communities safe. It was a time, it is a time, when we have looked out for one another and vowed that we're in it together. Uh, but it's also been a challenging journey for so many of us as parents. I'm a parent as well, uh, trying to balance full-time jobs while working with teachers to, keep, uh, to help with our kids uh, and their schoolwork. It has been difficult and there's no doubt about that. Fortunately, we were never alone. Uh, BC's educators and support staff rally behind their students. And like you, I have been touched by the extraordinary ways that teachers have gone, gone above and beyond and support staff to keep our kids engaged through technology or over the phone. And we've seen countless examples of innovation, kindness and compassion throughout BC. And we can't thank them enough. We all know, as Ravi said in his introduction, that a prolonged absence from in-class in learning, especially for students, who need extra support has grown harder to sustain uh, engagement and learning the, harder, the longer this has gone on. And that's why we're excited to get to this point where under the guidance of Dr. Henry, the Provincial Health Office, WorkSafe BC, uh, the BC Centre for Disease Control, uh, schools are able to slowly resume in a very gradual, part-time, safe and thoughtful way. This will give kids a month of that invaluable classroom time before they head off to summer and get them ready for what we hope is a full-time return uh, to school in September if it's safe to do so. Returning to school part-time on June 1st will be completely optional for families. Any parent who chooses to keep their child home can do so and, and remote learning op op options will continue to be available. So for every parent that does bring their child back to school, we'll have new and enhanced safety measures that will be in place to keep our kids safe. These come straight for our, from our health experts led by Dr. Henry, a true BC superhero and her team of capable experts that has worked tirelessly to work with us to keep all of us safe during the COVID pandemic. School's not gonna look like it was before spring break. There's no question about that. There will be strict health and safety protocols that guide school operations. It will look different and it has to, to keep students and staff, staff safe. And so I wanna thank people again uh, for taking the time tonight. I look forward to answering your questions, as many as we can get to in the next 45 minutes. And if we don't get to your questions, uh, I would remind people that the Ministry of Education regularly updates its FAQ section on our website to make sure you have the most up-to-date information. And just a reminder for those of you, it's gov.bc.ca forward slash safe schools. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Uh, and what I'm going to do is sort of combine some of the questions so we can get through a lot more of them today. Uh, and now I'll pass it over to uh, Trustee Higginson, the president of BC School Trustees Association. Thanks, Ravi. Ait Squail, everyone. Aikwana Seelam Namu. Entapa Stephanie Higginson, Sunitsana Snunemo. Um, I want to thank Ravi for hosting us tonight. It's great to be here with you and Minister Fleming and Dr. Corneal, and of course, our interpreter, Nigel. Uh, as you said, I'm joining you from the territory of the Snunemo First Nation, and I'm glad to have a chance to talk to everyone about what boards of education are doing to move to a partial return of in-class instruction. Boards are working hard across the province to ensure that the next step in the provincial pandemic response is done in a safe and healthy way that will meet the needs of the communities that they serve. You know, over the past few days, I've certainly heard from a lot of parents and staff and community members with questions and concerns. And I recognize the uncertainty that we all feel during these times. You know, for myself, I'm a parent of two school aged children. My family is supported by our own uh, family run small business. And my workload has increased significantly at a time when we're also trying to support our children's learning at home. And I don't say this to, uh, you know, lay bare all my current struggles, <laughs> but I say it because I can understand how it's hard for folks to see through all of this uh, and see past those various, you know, stressors and anxieties to be able to recognize that what, what this point that we're at right now, uh, having students return to classrooms, even on a part-time basis, is really a good news story for BC. Uh, together with the strong and decisive direction of our provincial health officer, uh, Dr. Henry, British Columbians have together flattened the curve very well. And so I want to give everyone a virtual high five on that. And it's a moment of celebration that I think sometimes we've forgotten how to do right now. And so, uh, you know, when, 
When in-class instruction was suspended on March 17th, we weren't sure we are going to be able to get to this place. And here we are tonight talking about the safe implementation of in-class instruction. And I think that's really exciting time. And I am also thankful you know, to Dr. Cornell and all the folks at Provincial Health who have given us such strong direction to get to this place and to all of British Columbians for doing their part. I'm looking forward to tonight to being able to answer some of the big questions that we hear out there about the return to in-class instruction so that people who choose to can feel confident in the steps that are being taken uh, by the boards of education to ensure that schools are safe and healthy places for students and staff and families and communities. And uh, I'm just gonna take a, a note from Ravi and also give a shout out to my kids teachers, Miss Hicks and Miss Poulin, who have become almost like a part of our family. I'm a little emotional talking about them. It's really how much, how much work they have done to support us is really amazing. And also to let you all know that uh, my kids are playing outside, so you might hear them. I'm coming to you from my home in my bedroom, and you may hear my children in the background, so hopefully that won't be too distracting for everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stephanie, and, uh, and uh, I, that's a good disclaimer. I should display and give everybody a heads up. My 10-year-old is in the room next door listening, I'm sure, <laughs> uh, and he may do a, a guest appearance as well, uh, even though we made the arrangement that I give a shout-out to Ms. Kondo. Um, I, I'm going to actually pass it over to Dr. Cornell uh, for him to provide some comments as well. Thanks so much, Ravi. Um, I do want to acknowledge the uh, Swimalt First Nation on which we're um, meeting today, or I'm meeting today, uh, and uh, really uh, start by, by saying uh, I understand uh, how difficult the last few months have been for people. Uh, it's been quite a challenge to uh, manage this pandemic, uh, and I'm very proud of the way uh, not just people in the Ministry of Health, but other ministries and you, the public, have actually um, um, done to, to bend our curve and, and flatten the curve. Uh, with that, of course, means we're um, trying to reset what our new normal is. Uh, and what is our new normal uh, in the context of education? We know that our children, uh, particularly those who are more vulnerable, uh, do need uh, education. Uh, there are children who are in need of care. Uh, and this is our opportunity to get things right uh, and, and to, to find out um, from you uh, what works and what doesn't uh, and how we can uh, take that forward uh, into the fall where we know things might get a little bit difficult uh, and uh, be ready and prepared. So I look forward to your questions as well. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Cornell. And uh, we're gonna get uh, we're gonna get going with the questions right away. And uh, since I'm the host, I get to ask a question that I want to ask uh, first. <laughs> I hope that's okay with everyone. And it's a question that, uh, quite frankly, uh, everybody in my neighborhood that's a parent uh, that has reached out to me wants to know. And you know, they all say the same thing, which is you know they appreciate that this coming back to school is gradual, that it's going to be uh, that it's optional, which is a really good thing, and it is part time. So they appreciate all that, but they all want to know like how did we come to this decision and so I'm gonna pose this to all of you but I'll start with Minister Fleming first. Sure. Thanks Ravi and um, look I think how we arrived at this is through very careful planning um, uh, being really transparent with people about the entire way that the public health care system and all all features of BC society uh, are performing under the pandemic uh, we have had a science-based approach on every decision uh, that has a guided government. We've also dis decided that it's it, this has to be an expert-driven process. You know, it's no accident that Dr. Bonnie Henry is 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 leading uh, a lot of the decisions and, and giving guidance to uh, government on on what is safe to do, including the strong measures we took at the very outset of the pandemic. You know, we were the first to close our borders, ban large gatherings, um, taking a lot of uh, uh, strong steps and actions that prevented uh, a widespread transmission. Um, of this disease and, and also, uh, you know, really stepping up uh, where there were outbreaks in long-term care facilities, those kinds of things, changing practices, having a very responsive healthcare system that, um, you know, has amongst the best people in the world uh, that we're fortunate to have uh, giving uh, government advice. So I think, uh, you know, you go back a week and a half, it was Premier Horgan who uh, announced uh, the restart plan in BC to get uh, parts of our economy moving again under new health and safety protocols to guide them. We put schools last in the uh, phase two uh, of the restart plan for a reason. We wanna keep our eye on what's happening here uh, in British Columbia. We are seeing very encouraging news. You probably saw an update again today 
that uh, shows uh, how far down we have bent the curve, how we have broken the chains of uh, transmission uh, in, in, in British Columbia. And we're, we're you know, keeping the healthcare system incredibly uh, well served and intact, and we've been able to manage the outbreak. So the school strategy is informed by a broader government strategy. It's about a unique tailored health and safety protocol. We have, it think, when we said things are gonna look different, they're gonna look a lot different. People are gonna have to practice physical distancing. We will have deep cleaning, regular cleaning of high touch surfaces, uh, very reduced numbers of kids. That's, that's what stage three of the, of the school plan is about. And we'll hope that if BC continues on this trajectory, that in September, if it's safe to do so, we can have a full restart of the school system. But we're very fortunate. We're one of the few jurisdictions in the entire world I think that is able to uh, have a gradual uh, restart of its school system. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Minister Fleming for that. And uh, I'll go over to uh, Trustee Higginson. Thanks, Ravi. Uh, you know, so how did we get here? I think we got here because of excellent guidance from our provincial health officer and office throughout this entire process. Uh, and, you know, and, uh, you know, a, a big provincial response, everybody did what they were told, we're very compliant. And, um, and I'm glad for that. And I think there has been an incredible um, collaboration amongst the education partners throughout this process. And I'm thankful to government for that and to the minister for that. Um, th throughout this entire process, students have always remained right at the center of every decision. And so everything that, you know, the minister pulled together a group of folks and every decision was what's right for students, what's right for students, what's safe, what's, you know, and, and, and from there it was what's right for our staff, what's right for our families and our communities. So knowing that it's the right thing to do for students, uh, when we were given the okay, uh, people were willing to, you know, go that extra mile and work hard because we know that having students in schools right now over the next 12 to 18 months is really important. Anytime we can have them there, we really need to have them there. So we're working really hard to make sure that it's safe. It will be safe. Although, you know, some of the minister's messaging makes it sound a little scary. I think it's actually going to be quite beautiful. Our kids over the last six to eight weeks have already been um, they've been learning all of this social distancing and hand washing. So when they go back to school, it's, it's a new environment for them to do it in, but they're, they're well versed in this already. And it, I think it would make them feel a little bit odd to be running into the school and thinking that they could do things just normally as well. And, and seeing the examples from other jurisdictions where uh, the schools have been back, like Denmark, there's videos and there's newscasts and the kids are enjoying themselves and the schools are, the hallways are filled. And that's what we're, that's what we're here for. So, you know, we came to this decision uh, as, you know, collaboratively at the direction of public health and also knowing that for, for five weeks, we've had almost 5,000 kids in schools across the province, you know, the, the essential service of support workers, children, and it's been, it's been going outstandingly well, and we've been really fortunate. So uh, we got here because we know it's the right decision for students. Yeah, thank you very much for that. Uh, I'm gonna pass over to Dr. Cornell. Yeah, thanks so much, Ravi. Um, it's important uh, that people understand uh, the, the basis for some of the decisions we make in public health. Uh, and, and the biggest one that we uh, knew we had to solve uh, was, was bending that curve down. But the second one was knowing uh, when a community, pre community spread um, had, had decreased significantly and basically to a level now where, where we can say that it has stopped. Um, and then third, we needed to make sure that we had everything in place to, to watch for cases and to manage for uh, manage those cases when they do appear uh, and, and pull that information together to, to make a good recommendation. Um, so I really want to uh, do a shout out to all the, the public health physicians who are in the back end, uh, the docs at BCCDC who are working uh, tirelessly to comb through this information and to come up with reasonable recommendations uh, for us. And, and that's what you see in some of the guidelines we've developed. Um, the other thing that's really important is for us to keep an eye on the literature. Um, there's a team at BC Children's Hospital, uh, Dr. Laura Sove, a team at uh, um, uh, BC Center for Disease Control under uh, Dr. Singal. And uh, every week they review all of the new publications and see how they fit together uh, and um, reach uh, some form of conclusion as we learn more about this virus. Uh, we've learned a lot. We've learned, uh, fortunately, that it impacts children uh, in a much different way than it does adults, which I think is, is, is a good thing. 
um, it, that does make it complicated uh, to, to articulate what to do next, uh, but it does put us in a good position uh, to support education uh, to go back. Uh, I think we're also really reassured by the fact that we've had so few actual cases uh, in BC. Uh, to date, we've only had 67 confirmed cases um, in children uh, since the start, which, which is a very low number. And of those, most have, um, have gotten better. Uh, and uh, the last few are well on their way. Uh, so it's those types of things that for us are, are very reassuring uh, and, and help put us on the path uh, that we're headed uh, June 1st. Yeah, thank you for that, Doctor. Um, so I'm going to just jump into questions here. So we've got one uh, from Catherine from Vancouver, and she's asking about how uh, um, asking about workload for teachers and support staff. What is the expectations of teachers? Uh, are they expected to teach at school while also supporting students online? Uh, have they been given any say or options? And um, uh, Minister Fleming, I'm going to go to you first on that one, and uh, and then uh, Trustee Higginson, uh, perhaps you can jump in as well after. Here's yeah. funny. Thanks, Ravi. Yeah, no, look, um, as, we, as I think all three of us have said um, already, and, and you, yourself as well, Ravi, um, teachers have supported us and our families incredibly well. We have to support teachers uh, now that we're moving into a different uh, stage and, uh, and in the future uh, until this pandemic is, is over. And uh, the concern around uh, workload balance, uh, not uh, pulling teachers in two directions simultaneously, which we know is impossible, uh, where they may be uh, uh, supporting uh, kids uh, who continue learning at home and, and those kids that are returning on a part-time basis uh, to schools. Uh, the way we have directed uh, districts uh, to uh, uh, work with teachers on this has been very explicit. All uh, school districts have to work with collaboratively their local teachers unions uh, to answer this question. There's a little bit of flexibility just in terms of how scheduling will be done in, in, in schools. You mentioned there, we have 1900 schools in BC, some very big, some very small, uh, uh, some rural and remote districts and those sorts of things. That's why we've said, look, every local teachers union has to be uh, contributing to uh, what a schedule will look like. They have to submit those plans to the ministry on June 1st. And we're already seeing uh, some very uh, innovative uh, ideas coming forward about, uh, about how teachers continue to support all of their students, uh, how other, Teachers and support staff will assist making sure that uh, all students, whether they return to school or not, uh, continue to be supported. Yeah, thank you, Minister Fleming. And uh, I'll go over to uh, Trustee Higginson. Thanks, Ravi. So, you know, to answer the question directly, have they been given say or options? I would say that one thing that teachers should feel uh, really confident in is the leadership they've had from their both their provincial president uh, as well as, you know, I know in my own district, uh, the local president has been extreme, they've both been so great at representing the needs of their members. And when we were talking about the possibility of this return at that sort of provincial level with this group of folks the minister called together, there was, you know, unanimous agreement that teacher workload cannot be increased and that we cannot pull teachers in a million different directions like the minister said. So the, the teachers unions have been part of this, these discussions. And I know that um, provincially that Terry has been representing her members very, very well. And as well, you know, like I said, locally, our, our, my superintendent is meeting almost daily with our union president as well to address all of the concerns that are being brought forward. And so really following through on the request from the ministry that they work collaboratively together. And there is agreement that teachers cannot be asked to do more than they were doing before uh, the, the suspension of in-class instruction. And that we certainly can't pull them in many different directions because that's not good for their mental health. And that's not good for the students. It's just not good for people's outcomes. So we really want to protect the teacher workload throughout this process and are trying to work hard. It's going to be different everywhere to the minister's point. You know, big schools, small schools, big districts, rural districts, remote districts. So it's going to look different everywhere, but each local president is going to work closely with the superintendent to ensure that their members have the best outcomes possible. Yeah, thank you very much for that. Um, so we, this is a really good question here from uh, Liz. Uh, I think she's a teacher on Pender Island. And uh, so her question is, in the 10 years I've been a teacher, I've seen countless co uh, colleagues and students sick and transmitting viruses back and forth. How do we adequately keep staff and students safe? So I think, Dr. Cornell, this might be best for you. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much for that question. Uh, as we all know, uh, Children have a special relationship with viruses uh, and uh, it's different and it impacts them in a different way than it 
impacts adults. Uh, and um, although many of the viruses that we are used to, influenza and some of the cold viruses, uh, do impact children and are spread by children, uh, this one is different. Uh, and, and that's what's unique, and that's what we're learning uh, as we go. It's not the only virus that acts differently in children. It's not the only bug or bacteria that acts differently in children. Uh, so the fact that it's different and doesn't seem to impact them in the same way is not new for us. Um, but it certainly uh, is um, it, it's something scary uh, for everyone, for parents, uh, for children, uh, and for teachers. Uh, what does this mean? Um, so we're doing everything we can to, first of all, ensure that we have very few cases in our province, and we've done that. Um, we are uh, very conscious of when there is a new case, uh, that we uh, follow that case up uh, and ensure that everyone is aware uh, around them and is able to go uh, and either be tested uh, if they're showing symptoms or um, uh, isolate at home. Um, we need to take a, uh, that's our public health approach. Then we need to look at the environment around us. What can we do in our environment or in your environment in the school uh, to make things safer? Uh, and that's um, good hand hygiene, that's uh, careful cleaning, uh, that's uh, ensuring uh, that adults are able to physical distance in a safe way, that we help remind people uh, to undertake some of these uh, activities in a different space, back in their workplace. What does this feel like? Then we move to things um, that, that we can control ourselves. So uh, myself, as a physician, what can I do? Well, I can stay at home if I'm sick. I think that is the most important thing uh, that we know about this virus, is that it is most uh, transmissible when you actually have symptoms, and that's when we need people to stay home. That in itself is a big shift in culture for, for a lot of people. Uh, we often feel like we need to be at work or in some situations, um, people have to go to work even when they're sick. And we have to somehow uh, fix that and find ways to support uh, both parents, children, and then teachers um, to stay home when they're sick. Um, and um, if all of those things are put into place, um, we know that the risk um, is very, very low, both for kids and for children. Thank you, uh, doctor. And uh, there's a bunch of questions and I know people want to ask a lot more. And so I'm going to bundle a few of the questions up. Uh, so we've got a couple of questions on graduation related questions. So uh, Chelsea and Kelowna asks, um, has a decision been made about offering of the numeracy assessment and provincial exams uh, last English uh, 12 communications 12 sitting for students who need to do so in order to graduate and Catherine from the news wants to know how will grade 11 students who need to apply to universities uh, next fall have legitimate grades to use in their application packages will uh, uh, um, we have been told that our district that no one will fail but that marking is not going to be accurate representation of the classwork. So I think I'll go to Minister Fleming for, for, for that one. Sure. Let me uh, answer Chelsea's question first, and I presume Chelsea is a student. I might be wrong, but um, I want to assure her and uh, all of the students out there who are uh, working towards their graduation right now, this pandemic is not your fault. Uh, and on March 17th, it's why we uh, outline very clear directions uh, to the school system um, for all students to move on towards the next uh, grade level based on their assessments to, uh, to that point in March. Um, and for the grade uh, 12 class of 2020, that uh, all of those who are eligible and on track to graduate will graduate. And, uh, and so um, the exams that Chelsea mentioned, um, those aren't uh, requirements for graduation. The, the only one that uh, is, is uh, still in play is the grade 10 numeracy assessment. Most grade 12s will have completed that because they've had two years to do so. Um, but we're looking at a range of options around, uh, around that uh, requirement. So stay tuned for that. Um, I hope that Chelsea's in touch with her teachers and those who are supporting her with her graduation journey um, uh, because uh, Chelsea should be uh, looking at a very bright future and. Uh, Looking forward to completing her um, her high school. It's uh, 13 years. It's a big deal. So, congratulations to you. Uh, in terms of um, transitioning to post-secondary education, which I think was uh, Catherine's question. 
uh, Ravi, which is, yep. is, yeah. So all of the post-secondary institutions in BC and around the world have looked at, you know, their admittance requirements and, uh, and the disruption that's happened in the, um, caused by the pandemic and are really playing a, a good role in, in uh, giving kids uh, certainty around uh, their acceptance um, and understanding that the, the, the normal completion uh, has been changed uh, because of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic around the world. So um, we're going to continue to work with BC post-secondary uh, education institutions, um, but they have really stepped up and been very responsive. They're always good to work with in terms of planning a seamless transition for, for kids, for young adults going into university or college. Um, in this situation, uh, even more so, the communication has been stellar. So I hope that's the case for, um, for students like her. Um, it, oh, she's in grade 11, I believe. So look, for grade 12, it's going to be the same thing. Um, the specific situation and how we emerge uh, stronger as a province is going to look after young people like her. Um, that's uh, top of mind for all of us. Thanks, Minister. Um, so a question for Mary, and I know my colleague Bob Deeth uh, also has a child graduating and he's raised this issue several times. Uh, the question is, what does the ministry have to put in place in order for grade 12 students to feel they are graduating this year? Uh, mm -hmm. Is there any celebration possible locally? Well, let me start. I'm sure Stephanie may want to, uh, to weigh in on this too, because she um, uh, is a trustee on a specific district. And we're hearing so many cool ideas uh, from right around the province about how to make this, this special, how to respect physical distancing, how to use technology like the technology we're using tonight to have a meaningful, memorable uh, commemoration. And uh, look, I know lots of the members of the grad class of 2020 will look to have a very early reunion to celebrate it properly if um, they're physically not able to get together with uh, uh, those who they've studied with and got to know and their friends and, and, and school colleagues. Um, but uh, we're also planning something provincial. Stay tuned for some details. We want to uh, recognize, and there's a number of prominent British Columbians who want to uh, take their cap off, I suppose, in solidarity with the class of 2020 and, uh, and, uh, and, and do something memorable uh, provincially. But um, really good ideas are, are bubbling up out there uh, from different districts. Stephanie might have an example uh, from Nanaimo that I'm not aware of, but graduation is inherently local. So we're, we're hearing really good examples of principals and vice principals. And now that we have um, school teams getting back together uh, in person, um, those ideas I think are going to uh, produce uh, some, some even more uh, memorable plans. Thanks. Come pass it to Trustee uh, Higginson. Thanks, Ravi. So, you know, I think um, this also... I just I want to put my heart out to the grade 12 uh, grad class of this year, because what a year to be graduating. I think, uh, you know, we haven't been in this situation for 100 years. There's literally, you know, no one around who can remember what it was like to graduate from high school during a pandemic. Uh, so what a time to graduate. And, um, you know, my, my heart goes out to you for for all the hard work that you've done to to get to this point um, and have it arrived during this time. Um, I, I, there are lots of ideas popping up that are happening um, across the province and I've heard some of the districts in the metro region are doing really, really neat virtual um, graduation ceremonies where they're sort of, they're going to, they're going to actually t tape it all together. I don't know what the right term is, but they're going to have the student come in, walk across the stage, you know, get their, their diploma. They're going to have the um, valedictorian speech and all the speeches and they're going to Put it all together into one stream so that the families can watch them and uh, and and it'll look like the, the thing was just happening there and i think that's you know a huge amount of effort to go into it it's not going to feel the same um, and it's of course this is also going to look different in the context we have you know urban districts that have you know a harder time with the whole physical distancing but maybe some of the more rural remote districts have the ability to work with their local health authority to deter to come up with something um, that might be a little bit more authentic. So it's going to look different everywhere, but I can guarantee uh, Mary, Marie from Coquitlam that um, people are really thinking hard about this and trying really hard to come up with some really unique uh, suggestions to make sure that the grads do know that they're really special and that people are trying really hard to, uh, to make sure that all their accomplishments are represented this year, despite the times that we're living in. Yeah. And uh, thank you for that. I know that, uh, 
I also agree, and I know Dr. Henry has said that before as well, that this is an amazing year to graduate. Uh, I did say that to a, a kid who's graduating, and I was met with eyes rolling, you know, so they're kind of <laughs> like, uh, yeah, thanks for that. But uh, I think they prefer a ceremony, but uh, it is pretty amazing, uh, and we're going to be we're going to have to be creative um, around this process. I have a question for from uh, Robert, who's connected to Henry Hudson School in Vancouver. And, and I think, uh, Dr. Cornell, this question might be best for you. He says, what is the process for COVID-19 contact tracing and parent notification in the school setting uh, with a scenario where a positive case is uh, detected? So I'll pass it over to you, Doctor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is this is what we think of as bread and butter public health. This is what we do on a day to day basis in the background that people aren't aware of. Uh, and I think there's been a great opportunity for people to, to, to understand um, when there is a positive case, um, there are two physicians that get informed at the same time. Uh, if there's a positive case of COVID-19. The doctor that ordered it gets a copy and actually a medical health officer gets a copy in the back end. Uh, and when we see a positive COVID-19 case, uh, we reach out to the, the healthcare provider that ordered the test. Uh, we reach out um, to the family, to the person, uh, and then we um, talk to that person about who they've been with uh, and uh, the people that they've spent uh, close time with in their house, people they've spent time with outside the house, and we sort out who actually may have been exposed. Uh, then we actually um, come up with a plan for each of those people uh, to stay at home and self-isolate uh, for uh, 14 days, uh, in most cases, uh, to ensure uh, that we don't have any more positive cases from that. So it's a very tried and true approach. It works very well, uh, and we, um, we, we depend on that. Uh, and, and you hear a lot of talk about contact tracing um, as one of the pillars of how we're going to make it through. And it's true. Testing uh, and contact tracing are, are really important. Um, to the question around graduation, I do want to uh, let you know that these medical health officers uh, are actually also the school health officers. So every school uh, has uh, their own uh, medical health officer that they can draw on to answer questions about their own uh, needs, their local way of planning things for graduation. They're right there with you to help answer um, questions about what types of group things could be done within a safe boundary. Uh, they're the same ones you get told about the positive results uh, and will work with um, a school with permission of that parent uh, to, to deal with a case. If that happens, and we certainly hope it doesn't, if that happens, um, this is what we're here for. We have a relationship with um, principals uh, and administrators, uh, and we help that school get through it. Uh, and uh, that may mean that that school needs to close for a short period of time, but it would be a very local situation. That's the advantage of having very little community spread uh, and almost no cases at this point in BC. We're able to control it uh, as much as we can. And we're committed to doing that so that you can feel reassured in your environments uh, that you won't be exposed. Yeah, thank you, doctor. And um, I'm trying to get through the questions as fast as I can. Uh, Mike on Facebook Live asked, uh, uh, does physical distancing guideline, the two meter space, apply to classroom spaces? And Dr. Cornell, I'll just pass that to you again. Mm -hmm. uh, so the two meter physical distancing is based on the fact that when someone coughs, the droplets um, spread. So if someone is actually sick, and remember, they shouldn't be at school if they're sick, they shouldn't be teaching, they shouldn't be learning from school if they're sick. Um, but if someone is sick, and they cough into that two meters, it, it can land on a surface, which you touch, uh, or in some cases, um, if they cough on you, you know, you might get a droplet in your eye, or breathe it in. Um, but it's, um, it's very much based on that. Uh, when we um, uh, look uh, at our adults, um, that is really, really important. Uh, when we get down to the younger ages, uh, we know that young adults, fortunately, are also reasonably uh, low infection rate, uh, our 12 to 18 year olds, uh, and that's very helpful. Um, so we know that they're learning how to physical distance, how to 
understand our adult social compact. Uh, so we are looking to them to try and social distance where they can. Um, when it comes to, this, to, to the little kids, um, it's actually very impractical to manage that. So what we're looking and what we're recommending uh, is that we help kids continue to understand no physical contact. Even that is difficult, uh, but if they can um, do that, uh, then the small um, risk that they do actually, um, you know, if there is a child who is positive, that will go a long way uh, in keeping any, any transmission from happening. Great, thank you for that. Um, we have a question from Northern Health Region, uh, Tim. He says, from June 1st, if my son's school has any empty spots, are they allowed to go back to school for more than two or three days? Um, Minister Fleming, you want to take that? Sure. Okay. Not knowing Tim's circumstance, um, or if he has a partner uh, also in the workforce, if they're an essential service worker uh, working on the front lines in the healthcare system, or even in essential service work like the transportation sector and uh, retail activities, they can go um, full-time to school now. So I'll put that out for uh, Tim if he was unaware of that. Uh, likewise, if, um, if their child is, is vulnerable and has special learning needs um, that uh, under normal times uh, uh, pr provides accommodations in the school system, um, they're part of a, a group of students that we would like to uh, uh, take care of on a, on a full-time basis. So don't know if that's Tim's situation, but on the restart, we're saying part-time, um, just you know, in terms of what Dr. Corneal just said. We have to reduce the uh, density of kids in the school system. So we want fewer of them in there so that they can adhere to physical distancing, you know, keep two meters apart. And, and, and even little kids can understand that. Uh, they can definitely understand no physical contact a lot better, but that's the reason why the restart is, is slow and cautious. It's, the, the goal is to have fewer kids there. Having said that though, I think, Tim should um, uh, reach out to the schools. I, I, you know, it could be that, uh, as he predicts, there, there'd be few kids uh, returning to school. But what we've seen in, in Denmark and, and New Zealand as recently as this week, because they had a restart of their school system, is that um, more of them come back uh, as, uh, as they begin to feel safe. And all of us as British Columbians are just starting to get used to the new normal, right? We're still uh, a week and a half away from June 1st. Um, things are changing right now in our daily lives. We're all practicing physical distancing and safe practices. Businesses are, are introducing new health and safety protocols. Schools have had a very strict health and safety protocol. They've been open for 5,000 students so far. Um, they'll have an enhanced uh, uh, health and safety protocol going forward for the uh, stage three restart. Thanks, uh, Minister, for that. Uh, here's a question from Tara and Langley, and quite frankly, my son asked the same question. Uh, can students use the playground equipment after June 1st? Uh, Dr. Grinnell, can you maybe take that? Yes, uh, absolutely. Um, we uh, know that playgrounds are a safer place. Uh, um, we know uh, that, um, you know, if, if families understand uh, that uh, they should be, um, you know, in smaller groups, uh, if we um, look after hand hygiene uh, and uh, ensure that there are opportunities to, to, for, for children to wash their hands uh, and for adults who are around the parks uh, to wash their hands, uh, then we're quite reassured uh, because being outdoors actually gives us um, some protection uh, because um, people aren't concentrated together in the same place and, and there's wind, which is helpful. Uh, and uh, so I think um, one of the best things we can do actually is be outside, uh, both for playing and for education as well, for certain educational uh, activities. I think it's a great idea to be outside. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, so Jenny from Abbotsford asked this question, uh, Minister Fleming, maybe you're gonna have to take this. Uh, and she says, Ontario owes isn't opening up until fall, and why is uh, why the most of the province are waiting, and so why is BC, BC opening up schools? Yeah, I, I mean, I think Ontario was looking for an opportunity uh, to reopen schools, but they're in a different position right now than British Columbia. We have flattened the curve in a, in a very unique way. We're the you know sort of top tier of, of jurisdictions on the planet that have been able to, uh, as I said earlier, break the uh, chains of community transmission. And, uh, and manage the outbreak. And it's not just, you know, we, we, we can be proud of our public health care system here and all the experts who've done that. Um, it's not to say Ontario uh, hasn't worked as hard. 
they had the misfortune of having spring break two weeks earlier than ours. And so they had no travel restrictions in place. They got more virus into Ontario and it's been harder for them to, to manage, I think, on that basis. And I, I look at the most recent data and it must have been very difficult for, you know, Dr. Bonnie Henry's equivalent and, and, and my equivalent, the Minister of Education in Ontario and the Premier, uh, to uh, to make to make a decision, we were we were in a much different position. They've had almost 2,000 cases, new cases over the last five days in Ontario. Um, British Columbia has had only 60, so they're they're not in the same place around uh, flattening the curve. And, and I respect Ontario's decision. They're doing what they think is right for their population, and we're doing what's right under the guidance and direction of Dr. Bonnie Henry and the PHO here in BC. Yeah, thank you, Minister. Um, good question here from Kathy and Langley. Um, a question about masks and PPE in school. Um, uh, I understand that PPP, PPE is not required in general education setting, but there is a small percentage of students, less than 1%, where physical distancing isn't possible. For staff working in those uh, specific students, or should, should they be wearing the PPE? And so, Dr. Cornell, maybe uh, you should take this one. Yeah. Um, so for children, we we don't recommend the use of um, uh, non-medical masks uh, because they actually um, touch their face more uh, and uh, they create more risk than they than they protect. Uh, so that's a really important point to understand. Um, we. Um, um, know that uh, in places that are uncontrolled, uh, such as uh, buses, where we can't actually um, sort out who may be riding the bus sick or who isn't riding the bus sick. Uh, well, schools, we can control that. Um, and if we can control that, uh, then the, the, the benefits of um, any kind of personal protective equipment uh, or um, non-medical mask outside of a healthcare setting uh, really is neg negligible. The best thing it can do actually is protect other people when you cough. We know that that works. Uh, so we're not recommending uh, the use of, of masks in, in schools. I think if there are some children um, or um, in some cases, some uh, adults who um, have significant um, uh, immune compromise or health condition, uh, they need to talk with their uh, family doctor or nurse practitioner uh, to really understand how the risks that we're describing uh, will impact them uh, and how um, and, and what additional precautions they should take in that case. Uh, it's usually not going to be um, wearing a mask. Uh, as we know, um, if you look at that triangle of hierarchy of things you can do, uh, the, the, the non-medical masks are the least effective. Um, but as I said, in uncontrolled settings um, where you know you can't physical distance, uh, they do play uh, a role, uh, which to some extent is why I think, um, you know, you're hearing what seems like mixed messaging around masks, um, but it's not. Um, the mixed messaging um, is really um, about what one does in public settings that are uncontrolled versus controlled settings. And, and I'm happy to say that schools um, and childcare are two settings where we actually have a lot of control, where school health officers and licensing officers are very involved. Uh, and, and we also know that the administration and the teachers are very careful uh, to ensure um, that it's a clean environment and that people are able to stay home when they're not well. Yeah, thank you. And since I'm controlling the, uh, the controls here, we're going to go a little bit longer. Uh, and so I apologize to all of you. Uh, hope you don't have uh, dinner dates uh, planned. So, uh, but we're going to maybe shorten up the answers. We'll ask more questions. Uh, and a great question from uh, Niru from uh, Kamloops. And she's asking, uh, as uh, health and safety measures, they said they will clean twice in a day. Uh, are schools uh, having extra cleaning staff? So how will schools be kept cleaned uh, as per the uh, health guidelines? And, um, and so I'll pass that over to uh, Trustee Higginson. Thanks, Ravi. So I think this is such a topical question. It's certainly one of the ones that I'm hearing most about out there. Uh, and I think first off, it's really important for folks to remember that one of the things that we've been doing really well for the last five weeks is that we have had 5,000 kids in schools um, of our essential service workers and we've got really good examples of cleaning protocols. 
uh, and things going really well. So uh, we've learned from there because we've learned so much that there has been no outbreaks, as far as I know, Dr. Corneille, in our essential support worker centers. So what we can do is take that and also take the protocols that have been laid out by uh, health and safety and apply them to the school setting. Will they have extra cleaning staff? That's gonna be up for, to each school district to determine and, and they'll, they'll look at that school by school and they'll determine whether that is something that's needed. And if it's needed, people will certainly redeploy their, ass, uh, you know, their resources in order to make sure that the schools are cleaned. And it's not a deep clean twice a day, it's cleaning high touch surfaces twice a day and a deep clean once a day. And so you know, our custodial staff can really focus on that deep clean once a day. And we can work closely with, you know, in my district, it's QP with our QP uh, local to determine who is going to be best uh, utilized to make to do those high touch surfaces. And I know as the Board of Education is very focused on making sure that cleanliness is the top priority and making sure that we can um, focus all of our resources to having those buildings be clean. I also keep hearing folks talk about um, you know, schools being germ factories. And, you know, I have to also agree, you know, having two kids in elementary school, you know, before March break, schools looked one way. So right now, like, the schools have never been cleaner than they are right now. Seriously, <laughs> they have never been cleaner. And it is the top priority of everyone to keep them that way. So it's going to look a little bit different. We're going to have half the number of students in the buildings. So we're going to be doing things differently and making sure that cleaning is the top priority. And it may mean that additional cleaning staff is put into schools, but that will be up to each district to determine how they're going to meet those health and safety protocols. Great, thank you for that. Uh, so we got a question here from Lori and she says, is there gonna be some sort of guidelines that each uh, district must follow and will there be proof that uh, they will in fact go by the guidelines? So I'm gonna kick that over to you, uh, Minister. Um, yeah, thank you very much, Ravi. And there, there is a set of guidelines that are publicly available. Um, I don't know if we can put in the chat the, uh, the website there, um, but um, they're very extensive. Uh, it covers everything around uh, desk spacing to hallway traffic flow to uh, some of the questions that Dr. Corneille has already fielded, uh, cleaning schedules, cleaning supplies. Um, all of those sorts of things are covered in the uh, health and safety protocols and they have been updated as recently as yesterday. They're in the field, all of the employee groups, um, all of the members of the school community are working on the basis of those guidelines right now. So. Um, they're going to submit to the Ministry of Education uh, by the 25th of May uh, a plan that shows how districts have uh, met uh, the guidelines uh, that have been uh, distributed. Great, appreciate that answer. Thank you. Um, there's a question here from Bonnie in Brentwood uh, Bay on Southern Vancouver Island. Uh, and her question is, as parents of, uh, of a child with a chronic health issue, I'm concerned that according to page six on the BC CDC guide for K to 12 schools, that students may come to school even if they had a person in their home presently diagnosed with COVID. How am I supposed to feel safe in sending our children when this is a provision included in the BC CDC guide plan? So Dr. Corneal, I'm, I'm kicking this one over to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's a common question. And uh, the answer is we, we need people to, um, to um, think about illness uh, in, uh, in the way, uh, in a different way. Um, we've been asking people to stay in their family units. Uh, to, to be in a safe bubble of people. And, and this is a big leap to actually um, say, okay, now you can break open your, 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 your family unit or your, your, your chosen bubble uh, and actually have some of the kids go to school. Um, what's most important is that people don't go to school when they're sick. If someone has symptoms, that's where we have the most risk. Uh, so that's the best advice. Um, and, and there's going to be a level of trust uh, that um, both uh, the um, administrators and the teachers are going to have to build uh, with their classes um, to reassure people that um, they have mechanisms in, in place uh, to ask, you know, people if they're sick or not. Um, if that's the case, and if, if we're able to maintain the good hand hygiene, if we're able to um, clean our surfaces properly, uh, the risk drops significantly. Uh, for an individual child uh, with uh, a special um, 
a medical condition or, or some immunocompromise, it's really important to narrow down whether or not that, um, that particular uh, medical condition actually increases the risk for the virus or not. And there's very few. And that's a very personal decision uh, that you as a parent uh, will make uh, with your family doctor and nurse practitioner uh, around what the best best approach is. We also know, um, though, that um, children who don't attend school, children who don't uh, get an education, uh, actually um, do um, um, suffer, um, particularly those uh, with mental health issues, particularly those, um, uh, if you look um, over time, who haven't had a chance to excel, uh, in, in their studies. Um, and that's part of what we're balancing here. That's a balance that you have to make as a parent uh, is, uh, do you want, uh, um, um, you, know, you know, there's a, there's a very, you know, is there a potential risk of infection? Well, we've done our best to make that as close to zero as we can. Is there risk of our child not going to school? Um, probably. And, and how, do we, how do we make that decision? Thank you for that. And I know Lynn on Facebook Live had a, a similar question. So I'll just, we'll just say that the, the same question has been answered. Uh, and uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to go to the last two questions. So um, we got a question here. Uh, Michelle from Penticton says, what measures will be in place for teachers who are in situations in which they live and care for uh, high-risk family members, uh, such as an elderly parent? Uh, if we are afraid to expose our parents to mm -hmm. what we are being exposed to at school, how can we keep our jobs and deal with caring for vulnerable family members on the top of the stress of caring for our children in our classes? And I had a friend ask me a, a similar question actually. So um, maybe I'll go to Trustee Higginson for this one. Sure, so uh, you know, I think that um, Michelle's question is one that's very topical for a lot of folks. And I would recommend that Michelle work closely with her local to work through those situations and those issues. But I also want to reassure Michelle that, um, you know, we, we're, we've moved in this direction because the Provincial Health Office has said it's safe to do so. And Dr. Cornel has laid out tonight all sorts of uh, ways that, that the schools are gonna be, you know, very controlled in how well they're cleaned and exposure and things like that. And so, you know, and, and, and to also look at BC in the bigger picture, you know, at the beginning I talked about how it's really hard right now with everything that's going on in our lives to try to be able to see the bigger picture and BC is doing a really good job right now. And so if you have concerns, then the best thing that Michelle can do is to work with her local to talk to them about uh, whether she, um, you know, what her concerns are, whether they do need to be accommodated and how Michelle can still, you know, can still work and be accommodated if that's possible. So there's all sorts of options uh, that we have available right now that she can utilize, but that's something that she's gonna have to work with her local on. I appreciate that, thank you. Um, we've got a question here from Catherine, uh, who's in Victoria, um, and I, I think it's an excellent question. Uh, what is the plan uh, to support K-12 students and school transition if there's a second wave in the fall? Um, and so, um, you know, I think we'll, well, I want all three of you to answer this, but if we can keep it short, because I'm seeing some good questions pop up on Facebook, and I might want to put a few more in there. So, um, so maybe we'll start with you, Minister Fleming. Yeah, and this is something we'll keep our eye on very closely. Um, you know, BC having done a very good job um, with this first wave um, could be set up to be in a much better position in, of defense uh, to a second wave. Um, you know, we hope for a full restart to the school system uh, in September. And, and as I mentioned earlier, we can't make that call until we see where we're at as a province uh, in late August. But I, I would just say this one thing. Um, one of the reasons that we're looking at a limited restart part-time, the way we've outlined it tonight and previously, is um, that's where we're at right now. We can do that safely under the guidance of, of professional health experts. We may have to you know, move forward and move backwards, depending on exactly that, the second wave scenario. And so we're going to have to get used to um, you know, learning remotely, uh, taking, a, taking a advantage of in-class instruction opportunities when they're there, because we could, we could, as I said, move move forward and move back uh, until we uh, until we have a vaccine and until we uh, win this fight. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Cordial. Yeah, I, I mean, I think um, we're in a good position right now uh, with so few cases uh, to give this a try, to be cautious, to explore um, how this might look. This is our month to to, to sort this out. 
we'll be watching very closely in the back end. Um, you'll um, you'll find that we'll be saying less. It's because that's often what public health does is, is, is we're looking after things in the back end. You will hear from us if the cases start to in, um, increase, uh, if there's ever a, a you know a, a cluster or an outbreak, and we'll also explain to you how we're managing that. So so that's what we get to do for the next three months is, is try that out. For school, it's the next month. Um, so in the fall, um, well, we already know there will be an increase in cases. This virus is here. It's not going away. Um, and there are a lot of other viruses uh, that, that, that float around in the fall and into the winter. And we're going to be doing a lot of additional testing uh, and ensuring uh, that we have a good handle on, on, on what the cases are. If we see an increase uh, in cases, if we feel we need to, to decrease the density um, in our schools, um, we have different stages that we can pull back to uh, and modify um, as we go. Um, I do think you're going to find uh, us taking a very school-by-school uh, -school approach uh, for cases and clusters should one occur, uh, and, and we'll manage that accordingly. Um, we're hopefully not going to find ourselves back in, a, in the place we were um, uh, eight or even four weeks ago where, where there were a lot of um, cases. Um, so hopefully um, all of the things that we've learned, all of the things that we're putting forward, all the different things we're trying um, will set us up well uh, for uh, when when bugs start to, to, to pass around again in the fall. Yeah, appreciate that. Um, Trustee Higginson? Thanks, I'll try to be quick. So, you know, to answer Catherine directly, so what is the plan? The, the ministry has developed those five stages and we'll move through those stages to the minister's point. It's going to be like a dial that we're going to have to, you know, move up, turn up and turn down uh, as these cases uh, as we move into the fall and if there may or may not be, you know, a second wave or more outbreaks. So we need to all learn, all of us, the system, individuals, families, parents, the students, we all need to learn to be a bit nimble over the next 12 to 18 months to be able to respond when that happens. It's, it's on all of us. This is a collective effort. And, and, and we've come so far in BC because we've taken that collective responsibility so strongly. And I, you know, I've, I've also become very confident in the ability of our public health office to respond when there is an outbreak or a community outbreak. And, and we saw that just recently with how well those, um, the poultry outbreaks were handled. All of these things have been tests on our system and, and we learn from every single one. So, you know, the development of those stages and our ability to be nimble and respond with public health, uh, I think is gonna set us up well for our kids to be able to, to keep their learning going through the, the next 12 to 18 months. Thank you for that. And um, I think you're all gonna kill me, but I'm gonna add two more. Uh, that I saw on Facebook, so I apologize for that. Uh, but there, there are some good questions here. So um, Asaya, I think I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, she says, how are schools going to regulate big crowds in the school, for instance, around lockers, uh, bays before and after school? Um, and so that's a, um, a question I think, Dr. Cornel, you might want to take up. Yeah, I, I think um, th there's, a, there's a couple of places where we need to be careful. One is um, where adults are coming in and dropping off their kids. I think that's going to be a, a bit of work. Um, those school districts who have been trying that uh, um, have a good uh, handle on how, how, how to control that a little bit better than maybe we have in the past. Uh, in the schools, uh, we are asking uh, particularly the older kids to, to try and, um, and physical distance where they can. Uh, and they are going to have to um, learn to move around schools in a different way. I think that uh, people have had a lot of practice for the last three months, uh, so I think people will do really well. Uh, and I think it's that, that, that extra cleaning and that extra um, hand hygiene, hygiene will, will get us a long way. Uh, that's what's important um, at the end of the day. Great, thank you. And maybe and, just uh, if I can add, Ravi, yeah, just, just from what I'm hearing from school districts who are deep into the planning phase now on the guidelines, um, I hate to break it to this questioner if they're a student. You might, you're probably not going to be able to use your locker. I think kids are going to have to bring a bag, keep their own stuff with them, not share anything, you know, pens, calculators, stuff like that. So uh, the lockers are just additional high-touch surfaces, probably not going to be in play. 
Yeah, thank you for uh, um, that addition. So uh, this will be the last question. It's uh, Ruth, I just threw that up on Facebook, I think, and it says, uh, what is going to happen to the children who have fallen behind in education because of COVID-19? Uh, will there be uh, methods put in place in future to help these kids catch up? Yeah. Minister Fleming, I'll give you that one. Sure, and Stephanie might want to jump in, but I think um, the teaching profession in BC is very mindful of this and the education support workers who work on literacy and those sorts of things. They know there's going to need to be lots of remediation when we get back to something that looks a lot more normal, um, you know, going over some of the competencies that is part of um, kids progressing through their learning careers. And that's nothing to worry about. We've done that before, um, and, uh, and, and, and teachers know how to do that again. Um, I would say, though, that uh, we're working with those districts that typically offer summer school to have summer school offerings happening, again, uh, physically distanced as we're in, in this stage. Uh, so stay tuned on that. Um, summer learning opportunities for districts that normally provide them will be available. Yeah, um, uh, Trustee Higginson? Sure. I think, you know, it's, it's so tricky because we're entering into this next 12 to 18 months where things are just going to look a bit different. But under normal circumstances, when students return in the fall to school after that long break, teachers are assessing the students to figure out where they've been, you know, where they're at in their learning. And that will continue and it'll probably be more important than ever for teachers to be, you know, really, really, um, you know, on top of that assessment at the beginning of the year that they're doing and maybe a little bit more. And, you know, if I could tell a personal story a little bit about this, you know, my, my sister is deeply involved with a family from Syria that she sponsored and her, her fa the family that she helps, she stays, she stayed involved with them for many, many years since they've been to Canada. And those children, there was five of them, four of them, and they haven't, um, they hadn't been in school in about four years. And it took about, uh, they, they, you know, they were living in a, a war-torn area of a refugee camp and it took about a year and a half for the kids to catch up. And now they're thriving. Uh, and so I think we all need to remember that there's lots of examples globally, and this is very unusual for us to have kids out of school for long periods of time, but there's also lots of, um, lots of good global resources for us to be able to help kids who may be really far behind catch up. We, we know kids can do this. They are resilient and they will, but it's also another reason why when we have the opportunity, we need to have kids in the buildings at every chance we can have over the next 12 to 18 months. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, well, that brings us to the end of the Q&A today. And uh, there were some fantastic questions. Uh, and, uh, and I appreciate everybody that's been tuning in. Uh, thank you, all of you for uh, being patient with my uh, adding more questions and, and, and running out longer than, than we had projected. Um, I know that some of the questions we got on Facebook, we uh, weren't able to get to, but thanks a big shout out to the social media team who's been trying to answer some of those questions uh, behind the scenes. Um, and uh, thank you to everyone that participated. Uh, you know, I, we really appreciate your questions. We really appreciate your uh, participation and engagement. Uh, parents, if you have specific questions uh, for your, about your child, uh, about uh, what's going to happen in school, please contact your local school board. Um, the Ministry of Education website regularly updates its facts, and it's a great uh, resource um, for information if you have some questions. Uh, and if you have further questions or comments about government's response plan, please go to gov.bc.ca for dash COVID-19 survey. I also invite you to join my colleagues, Harry Baines, Minister of Labor, and Janet Rutledge, MLA for Burnaby North, for a town hall on workplace safety. Um, that will be happening tomorrow evening at 7.15, live on uh, Facebook. And uh, in closing, as uh, Dr. Henry often says, uh, be kind, be calm, and be safe. And as Minister Dix always says, uh, we got to be 100% in. And so with that, I want to thank everybody and uh, have a good evening.